vacation. Um, him and myself and the girls will be leaving for Florida next week. Uh, Reverend Settles will be filling the pulpit next week, and then Reverend Todd will be filling the pulpit uh, as he always does on the third Sunday. So um, it's we'll miss you all, but it's I'm I'm looking forward to just to getting away and just doing a whole lot of nothing. Sounds sounds like a good plan to me. But um, but well, I'll just leave that remind app in there, and you see it on the back of your bulletin. It's very easy to do. Uh, we'd love for everybody to get signed up for um, for that. Any other announcements? No other announcements? I know we have one birthday today, at least one birthday. Uh, it's Jack's birthday. He, it was his birthday yesterday, and uh, he, didn't want, he didn't want us to sing to him yesterday, but he's not getting out of it. He's not getting out of it today. Did anybody celebrate a birthday with Jack this past week? All right, Roy is getting fired up and ready to go. Let's sing. Jack. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday to you. Happy birthday, dear friend. Happy birthday to you. Amen. We are so thankful for Jack. and. Um, his love for the Lord Jesus Christ. Uh, for those that don't know, he just recently moved out uh, of his family's house and got his own place. Uh, so we're thankful for another young man in our community that is living for the Lord Jesus Christ and setting that example for other young people. We rejoice in it. And he's going to work for us this morning because he's going to be leading not only the song of the month, uh, but my mother had uh, some heart issues last night, all night long, so my father's not here today. So Jack will be leading the songs for us this morning. Any anniversaries this past week? No anniversaries? Okay, Adam. Good morning. Good to see everybody. What a big crowd. And if you came to Sunday school down there, you it was standing room only, I promise you. You know what? Is it really getting much better? It says it's on. No, it's on. It just said. I'll talk loud. I'm gonna I'll use my gym voice, not my teacher voice. All right, the, do I have any praise reports you'd like to share with the congregation this morning? And, uh, amen for that. Praise God for that as well. I think uh, I was concerned, I'm going to be honest, that five in the afternoon was going to be about 100 degrees. And you know what? Crazy. It was beautiful. It was really a nice afternoon and great food, great fellowship. And then I didn't try it, but I know there was homemade ice cream. Somebody even said, right? So, but it was all, all the food was fantastic. Banana pudding, that's right. Uh, Paula Dean's Ain't Your Mama Banana Pudding. For those of you that missed that. But what a great time. Uh, any other praise reports? Before? Yes. We were praising it here as well. I'm glad you got to be a part of that. Glad to hear that. Uh, any others this morning? That's good. So we're good. We're good there. Just the. Well, at least that's one less thing, right? One less thing. One less thing. Yes, Susan. That's good. That's good. I going to try to keep you safe this time. So, avoid steps and all those things, right? 
or the, the, the rock. All right, anything else this morning? Thank y'all for the praise reports. Always good to hear those. And as we talked about in Sunday school, you know, we come together to encourage each other, to keep each other's eyes on the prize, as I said down there. I think that's what we'll continue to do, hopefully. Uh, anything else? All right, if there are no other praise reports, let's go to our prayer list this morning. We did have uh, some come in. We had Chrissy Vickers this week. I sent that out as a remind. And I, if I ever send you, and I'm just letting y'all know how that thing works, it's it's a it's a weird deal. And I did find out a week or so ago, and I forgot to tell you this. Parent Square, which is some of you that know that, is a company that has bought Remind. And I told you we were kind of on the thing, but I had met with Parent Square a couple of weeks ago when I was at my conference, and they are going to keep Remind in its intact as it currently is for at least for an extended period of time at this point. So still there. But if you send me a Remind, I try to use whatever you sent me as the language. I may do it a little bit, but if it's really, really lengthy, it only it's just like every other character limit. So I just take a screenshot and then I attach that screenshot in the remind, which I think works fine. I just want you to know that if you get an image, it's because of that. It's not because I didn't want to redo your text or anything like that. It's just it's I don't want to take anything away from your text is what it comes down to. Um, but that's why we got Chrissy on there as well. Uh, any others this morning? Additions, updates, corrections to the prayer list. Greta as well. So we'll remember Greta. Continue to remember Greta. And out, and you had the family this morning. Who was the Robert Brotherton? So, thank you for that. Mike McCandice will be removed today. Praise, praise God for that. Any others this morning? Yes. Yes. So continue to remember Beverly this morning and, and keep us up to date as we go as we go through that as well. Or thank you for that update, Geraldine. Yes, Cindy. Yes. Yes, Grayson. Thank you for that. Glad to have you. All right, any others this morning? All right, if there are no others, let's bow our heads. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, we come before you today on this on this weekend of independence, Lord, that gives us the opportunity to be here today to worship for all its glory, Lord. We don't want to lose sight of you in any of that mess that goes on, Lord, and, and all the liberties that you enable us. Lord, but as we go to our prayer list today, the names that have been mentioned, the, the loss of loved ones, the, the ongoing cancer treatments, uh, the ongoing medical treatments, the pending surgeries that will be coming up, Lord, we just ask that your peace and understanding and and for great physician be with the hands and the talents that you've given here on this earth so they can heal those people back to your service today, Lord. And as we go through this service today, Lord, we ask that you be with Ryan as he delivers the message to us, Lord. Uh, be with us as we receive it and help us continue to go out here in this world and encourage not only each other, but the world that needs it, Lord. And we just love you. We thank you for all the fellowship that you enable us to do, Lord. For it's in your son's name that we pray today. Amen.
Beloved Church of God, the Lord God Almighty, He is our Maker, He is our Creator, He is our Redeemer. We love Him. We're here to worship Him this morning, for He alone is worthy of our worship and all of our praise. So He calls us to worship Him, He welcomes us in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit and says, Grace be to you and peace from God our Father and from the Lord Jesus Christ. Blessed be God, even the Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, the Father of mercies and the God of all comfort. Amen. Amen. He calls us to worship Him this morning from Psalm 135. 1. Praise ye the Lord. Praise ye the name of the Lord. Praise Him, O ye servants of the Lord. <clears throat> And we corporately respond with that call to worship from Psalm 121, 1, and <clears throat> excuse me, 1 and 2. I will lift up mine eyes unto the hills. Amen. We're going to prepare our hearts now with a new song of the month. And it's going to be found in your Trinity hymnal, page 469. How sweet and awesome is the place. And I sent this out via Remind. So another advantage of, of having the Remind app. Um, if, you, if you're able to have that. And folks hopefully were able to listen to this on YouTube. And kind of get a feel for it. And I know you'll pick up on it pretty quickly.
Thank you for Jack and Nelly for doing that and leading it. You know, there's a little bit of a tricky spot there in the middle, but Nelly did a fantastic job there with that, as well as Jack. So, thank you for these young people. It makes my heart sing with praise to see them serving the Lord Jesus Christ. Please pray with me. God, our Father, help us this morning to encourage ourselves in you, O oh Lord, and help us also to encourage one another in our prayers and in our actions to worship you well. To this end, you have called us here this morning. Help us consider who you are, O oh God. Help us to consider what you have done and what you have promised in your word. In considering these things, may our hearts rejoice in your goodness and mercy. And Lord, may it ever satisfy us to have you as our Father, to have Jesus as our Savior, and to have your Spirit as our guide and comforter. And knowing Though we may not have everything we think we want in this life here below, please remind us from your word that we have heaven as our portion, and in that we may ever be content. We have the Lord Jesus Christ, and he has us. We are our beloved. He is ours this morning. So Lord, receive our worship this morning. For we offer it with true and sincere hearts, though imperfect it may be. May our prayers to you be a sweet-smelling savor. May our songs to you be a glorious sound in heaven and earth. May our confessions be the delight of our souls, and may the public reading and preaching of your word be our heavenly man of this hour. For truly, we delight in you. In the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen. Amen. We transition now to a time where we confess our faith together, and what a joy and privilege to be able to do so. The word of God calls us from Hebrews 10, 23, to hold fast, the confession of our faith without wavering for the Lord who promised. He is faithful. He is who we love and serve and adore this morning. On the front of your bulletin, Westminster Short of Catechism, question and answer 67. It simply asks in the question, which is the sixth commandment? The sixth commandment is, thou shalt not kill. It's a really, it's a shame, and I won't go off too much on, on a tangent, but it's a shame when, when both platforms do not heed the word of God. It should be clear and cut without any excuses that abortion is killing that baby, that abortion is murder of the unborn. May God forgive us in our country for allowing such a travesty horror to go on and may God grant repentance beginning with the church on the back of your bulletin is Heidelberg Catechism question and answer 47 is not Christ then with us even unto the end of the world as he hath promised Christ is very man and very God with respect to his human nature he is no more on earth but with respect to his Godhead majesty grace and spirit he is at no time absent from us. Amen. He is no time absent from us by his spirit. And this morning he speaks to us from his word. And we rejoice in that. The Apostles Creed, please confess this with me. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and in Jesus Christ, his only begotten son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Ghost, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, dead, and buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sitteth at the right hand of God, the Father Almighty. From thence he shall come to judge the quick and the dead. I believe in the Holy Ghost. I believe in a holy universal church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We transition now to our call to confess our sins from the Lord Jesus Christ himself. He tells us and teaches us to pray and forgive us our sins. And so we teach others and we tell others that we believe in the forgiveness of sins. And that is why we can call sin for what it is, a horror and a travesty. Because Jesus Christ died for our sins. He died for the sins of all of his elect. And that's the good news that we have to tell the world today. They don't have to live under the guilt of sin. There is forgiveness. There is freedom through Jesus Christ, our resurrected Savior. 
Let's think on those words as we go to time of silent confession of individuals. Beloved, God's covenant assurance of pardon for our hearts this morning comes from Isaiah 43, 25. Think on these words as God Himself speaks to our hearts and says, I, even I, am He who blots out your transgressions for my own sake. and I will not remember your sins. In Jesus Christ we are forgiven. Thanks be to God. Amen. We're going to continue to sing from the Trinity hymnal this morning. We've switched it up a little bit uh, from the songs that we had originally planned through, through poor Roy a curveball this morning, but he is a trooper. As always, we're so thankful for our dear brother in Christ, Roy, and all he means to our little church as well as Rita. But this morning, we sang a song last night from the Trinity hymnal from hymn 449 called We Rest on Thee. You may not know the words or be familiar with the words if you weren't here last night but it is sung to the tune of Be Still My Soul or also A Christian Home and probably other songs. So I think you'll know it well. So please stand with us and let's sing out to our Lord Jesus Christ.
Amen. Amen. Number 120, all things bright and beautiful. What we're going to do with this is we're going to start off with the chorus. That's the part at the top, all things bright and beautiful, all creatures great and small, all things wise and wonderful, the world God made them all. We're going to sing that through. We'll sing the first verse, go back to the chorus, sing verses 2, 3, 4, and 5, and then go back to the chorus. So after the first and last, we're going to sing the chorus. <laughs> What a sweet song to sing to our great God this morning. Please pray with me. Oh God, you are our God, and righteous are you in all your ways. And we confess that you are holy, true, just, and good. We know these things about you because you have revealed them to us in your word. And you have shown them to us in our lives time and time again. Lord, in light of so many wonderful truths we find in your word, how, O oh God, could we, your people, ever grumble and complain? We have it so much better than we deserve. You have taken us from darkness to light. Father, in order to be thankful, we must remember. We must remember your mighty deeds. As we just sang that, that precious song, we must remember all that you have done. You have commanded us from your word to do this very thing. I think of how many times you have used your servants in the Old Testament to remind your people of your covenant love and faithfulness, to remind your people that you go before them and you fight for them and defend them. And Lord, nothing has changed for the people of God today. And we must remember these truths from your word. And we must speak of them to the next generation over and over and over again, reminding them of these things. Let us never grow weary in this, our duty to do. Father, this morning I pray in particular for every man of God who ascends into the pulpit, whether in our community, across the nation, or across the globe. And they're preaching the true doctrine of the Word of God and preaching the true gospel of Jesus Christ. 
Help them to remember your goodness. And in remembering your goodness, may their hearts burn with a love for you and the gospel. And may that love shine forth in their preaching. The, the very word of God may it be infectious to the people of God. May hearts be sanctified and may sinners be converted by the very power of the gospel. Even this morning at Post Oak, may the preaching of your word not fall upon deaf ears. May the man of God be filled with your spirit and speak that which is true and good and life-giving to the soul. As we hear these things, may your spirit so apply them to our hearts that we learn to not just be hearers of the word, but to be doers. As we listen, our minds will be tempted to wander. Please let it not be so. And then as we leave this very place, our hearts will be tempted to just leave what we have heard here. To say to ourselves, well, we did the right thing by going to church today. Now let's, let's go live for the flesh. Almost as if we think checking a box is pleasing to you. Knowing from scriptural examples such as Cain and Esau, that nothing could be further from the truth. Lord, don't let us go down the path of men like Cain and Esau. So in love with self and the world, they disobeyed you and despised you in their hearts. Please arrest our hearts for Jesus' sake, for things eternal and holy. And may we be holy, for you are holy. May we go out into the world as the salt and light you have called us to be. Let us rejoice in doing so and always be looking to the end result, the salvation of our souls and an eternity with you. And may we ever continue to pray back to you the words our Savior taught us to pray, saying, Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power, and the glory forever. Amen. Brian, can you come take an offering for us? response to the giving of tithes and offerings, let us sing the doxology. Praise God from whom all blessings flow. Praise Him all creatures here below. Praise Him above ye heavenly hosts. Praise Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. Amen. Thank you. Beloved, God has continued to do such a marvelous work in our presence. And this morning, Samantha Quinga comes to join Post Oak. Presbyterian Church. She has already been received into full communicate membership by the session. And so I'm going to ask her to stand even now before the church. She's going to answer the questions that she answered before the session. My heart just overflows with joy. It really does. Um, I want you to get to know Samantha better, learn, learn her story and how God brought her to us uh, because it's an amazing thing. And a lot of it has to do with 
the YouTube, um, the fact that we're on YouTube. And so um, I told Adam back there because he labors over that and he does a fantastic job with that. And all praise be to God, but God has, God has used that uh, to bring Samantha our way. And I rejoice in that. So, beloved Samantha, in the Lord Jesus Christ, we thank our God for the grace that was given to you. In that you have accepted God's promise of salvation, you have publicly confessed your faith in the Savior, Jesus Christ. And we rejoice this morning that God in His gracious providence has brought you into our congregation and given you a desire to reaffirm the faith that you have previously professed and to unite with us. We rejoice. I think you saw that this morning in the tears of joy when you met with the session. So we ask that you testify before us to the faith that you profess by giving assent to the following questions. Do you believe the Bible consisting of the Old and New Testaments to be the Word of God and its doctrine of salvation to be the perfect and only true doctrine of salvation? Do you believe in one living and true God in whom eternally there are three distinct persons, God the Father, God the Son, and God the Holy Spirit, who are the same in being and equal in power and glory, and that Jesus Christ is God the Son come in the flesh? You confess that because of your sinfulness, you abhor and humble yourself before God, that you repent of your sin and that you trust for salvation, not in yourself, but in Jesus Christ alone. Do you acknowledge Jesus Christ as your sovereign Lord? And do you promise that in reliance on the grace of God, you will serve him with all that is in you, forsake the world, resist the devil, put to death your sinful deeds and desires and lead a godly life? And finally, do you promise to participate faithfully in this church's worship? and service to submit in the Lord to its government and to heed its discipline, even in case you should be found delinquent in doctrine or life. I ask you just to remain standing for a moment, Samantha. We're going to be walking with you every step of this journey. And so I'm going to speak to the congregation even now. As Samantha is received into full communion in the church, the whole congregation is obligated to receive her. For in Christ, we are members of one another. Christ claims this dear sister as his own and calls you to serve her in love. Therefore, you ought to commit yourself before God to assist Samantha in her, in her Christian nurture by godly example, prayer, and encouragement in our most precious faith and in the fellowship of believers. So beloved, in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ, I welcome Samantha this morning to all the privileges of full communion within the congregation of God's people. And I charge you, Samantha, to continue steadfastly in the confession that you have made, humbly relying upon the grace of God in the diligent use of the means of grace, especially the word of God, the sacraments, and prayer. Rest assured, if you confess Christ before men, he will confess you before his Father who is in heaven. And may the grace of God who called you unto his eternal glory in Christ after you have suffered a little while, perfect, establish, and strengthen you. To him be the glory and dominion forever and ever. Amen. 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 You may be seated. Woo. Please take your Bibles with me this morning to the Gospel according to Luke. Chapter number five. Beloved God is about to speak to us from his holy word. Let us see that we do not refuse him who speaks to us. Hear now the word of our great God. And they said unto Jesus, why did the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisee, but thine eat and drink. And he said unto them, Can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? The days will come when the bridegroom shall be taken away from them, and then shall they fast in those days. And he spake also a parable unto them, No man putteth a, new, a piece of a new garment upon an old, if otherwise then both the new maketh a rent, and the piece that was taken out of the new agreeeth not with the old. And no man putteth new wine into old bottles, else the new wine will burst the bottles and be spilled, and the bottles shall perish. But new wine must be put into new bottles, and both are preserved. No man also having drunk old wine straightway desireth new, for he saith, The old is better. 
the word of our great God. We know the grass withers, the flowers fade, but the word of our God abides forever. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Amen. Let's pray. Father, we thank you for your word. We thank you for the truth found therein. Truth that changes our hearts. Truth that converts the unconverted and never leaves us the same. Give us eyes, we pray, to see and ears to hear what the Spirit saith this morning. We ask all these things in Christ's name. Amen. Amen. Well, to be or not to be, that is the question. One of the most quoted lines in literary history had Hamlet puzzled over the choices of life. Is it better to live and suffer or to die and see what death truly holds? On one hand, death would end life's heartaches. But Hamlet feared what the dreams of the sleep of death held for him. Uncertainty filled his mind when he spoke those words. Do we as Christians, do we as the covenant people of God this morning, live in such uncertainty about the matters of life and death? We should not. For we have a great hope that comes to us from God Himself. That God has covenanted with His people through Jesus Christ our Lord. And with the finished work of Jesus Christ as the ground of our faith and everlasting hope. We do not have to ask, as Hamlet did, to be or not to be. Paul wrote these words in Romans 14. He penned, For no man lives for himself, no man dies for himself. Whether we live, we live unto the Lord. And whether we die, we die unto the Lord. Whether we live therefore or die, we are the Lord's. That is one of the great foundational truths of the Christian worldview. We don't belong to ourselves. We belong to the Lord who made us and redeemed us. And so whether we live, we live as His. And whether we die, we die as His. And there is such great comfort in that knowledge for the Lord's covenant people. There's a great comfort and knowledge about life that was eluding Hamlet when he spoke those words. To be or not to be is not the question for a Christian. However, if you add some words behind the phrase, to be or not to be in that question, I think then it becomes much more applicable to the Christian worldview. For example, what if we ask to be reformed or not to be reformed? That is the question. To be Pado Baptist or not to be Pado Baptist? That is the question. To be premillennial or not to be premillennial? That is the question. To be a strict Sabbatarian or not to be a strict Sabbatarian? That is the question. In a Christian worldview, these are the questions that are not as easily answered as the matter of living and dying, as the matter of the existence of life. We don't have to read very much church history to see how true that is. All you really have to do is look at the number of denominations that exist today. To understand that not every Christian answers those questions about the matters of ecclesiology or eschatology or covenant theology in the same manner. And I wonder this morning how that affects your mind when I say that this morning. For someone like myself, I've given much thought to these things over the years and I've often wondered this question. Why in the world can't people just be and think like me when it comes to scriptural matters? I made myself a little note here to pause and let that sink in. Actually, that was probably more the Ryan of 20 to 25 years ago. Some of you won't believe that, but it really was. I'm sure I've told you this story before, but back in the summer of 2003, this was pre-kids. Amelia was born in 2004, so in summer 2003, Kim and I visited Colonial Williamsburg, didn't we, dear? And in that park, you're able to go into a, a mock colonial church where there were people dressed up in colonial garb, living like those in the colonial days. It's fascinating. I loved it because I'm a history buff. 
in the church, there was a minister there speaking and discussing religious things with other spiritual men. And as a guest in the park, you got to sit in the audience and you got to observe this in real time. It was very much part of that, the ambience, the ambience of that, that park, Colonial Williamsburg area. And then they, when they finished, they, they spoke for a while, but then when they finished, they opened it up for thoughts and questions from the audience. Oh, beloved, the Puritans, the pilgrims, were very much Calvinists. So the majority of the discussion that they had centered around Calvinism. And at the time that Kim and I visited the area, I was very much anti-Calvinistic in my doctrine. So when they asked the audience to participate, boom, my hand went straight up. And for about five straight minutes, I kid you not, I speak this to my shame. I went on an anti-Calvinistic rant and just ripped those poor individuals on stage to shreds. And I got done and I looked around. I was like, yeah, buddy. Who's with me here? I hadn't noticed, but Kim had crawled under the pew beside of me, and everyone else in the audience was staring at me in horror with their jaws wide open. The poor stage actors, who I don't even know if they were Christians or not, were just kind of looking at each other like, what do we do now? And Kim proceeded to crawl out from under the pew. She probably didn't raise her head, but she promptly grabbed my arm, jerked me out of the church as fast as she could. I think they actually let us stay in the park and didn't kick us out after that, I think. But my point is, fast forward 20 plus years, and here I stand as a Reformed minister in a Presbyterian church. And so this illustration is just dripping with irony, because back then I was disturbed because I wondered why everybody couldn't just be semi-Pelagian, pre-millennial, credo-baptist, Christian, just like me. How much better of a place would the church be if that were the case? That's what I thought. And the irony is that I'm not even semi-Pelagian, premillennial, or credo-baptist anymore. And so I've learned with years of experience to no longer ask that question, why can't everyone just think and act like me when it comes to scriptural matters? Beloved, I want you to know this morning, the Christian worldview does not always agree on varying degrees of scriptural matters. Now, what I think we can disagree, what I don't think we can disagree on are the core fundamental doctrines such as we recite every Lord's Day in the Apostles' Creed. I've said it many times before after we're done reciting the Apostles' Creed, and I'll say it many times again. We can, we can disagree on certain things, but not one of those things are found in the Apostles' Creed. The Christians do disagree on various things not pertaining to the core doctrines of truth found in the Apostles' Creed, and we see that in our text this morning. This kind of takes us full back you know, back full circle to Hamlet's question, to be or not to be, that is the question. But that isn't the question for Christians, Hamlet. But pertaining to our text this morning, we might rather ask to fast or not to fast. That is the question, because that is the question we see in our text. And you might be surprised by who's asking the question. So I want us to dive into the text. And we see in verse 33, the question is posed to Jesus. Why do the disciples of John fast often and make prayers? And likewise, the disciples of the Pharisees, but thine eat and drink. Why did the disciples of John and the disciples of the Pharisees fast, they asked Jesus. But your disciples eat and drink. Now, who's asking that question? Well, we, we back up to verse 30, and we have to remember the context of what's going on here. The scribes and the Pharisees in verse 30 were murmuring against Christ's disciples, saying, why do you eat and drink with publicans and sinners? Do you, remember, do you remember what's going on here? Jesus had just called Matthew to follow him as his disciple. Matthew did that very thing, and then what did Matthew do? Immediately he threw a feast for Jesus and invited other publicans and sinners to come and see Jesus. And when the scribes and the Pharisees saw this, they murmured against Christ's disciples because Christ and his disciples were eating and drinking with publicans and sinners. And we remember from the last time we were in the gospel, according to Luke, that Jesus shut them down very quickly in verses 31 and 32. And he said, they that are whole need not a physician, but they that are sick. I came not to call the righteous sinners to repentance. Jesus told them, I have come to seek and to save those who are lost. I've come to call those to faith and repentance who need a savior. Now, beloved, the scribes and Pharisees, as I probably made 
made mention of the last time we looked at that text. They weren't stupid people. They were very well educated. They were, they were very well learned people. And so they had to understand what Jesus was doing when he said that he came to call those who saw their need for Jesus as their physician, their Messiah. Because if there's one thing that's true about the scribes and the Pharisees, they in fact did not believe Jesus was the long-awaited Messiah. So they understood, they had to understand Jesus was condemning their unbelief. But did they see it as, as unbelief? Of course not. Of course not. They were self-righteous. They were beings who were holier than thou. And they didn't care one bit to wear that as what they considered to be a badge of honor. And they didn't even waste any time proving this was the case because in verse 33, it's like they didn't even, like there wasn't even a breath. In the very next breath, they're asking Jesus, well, why don't your disciples fast like we do? See how quickly, you see the irony again here? Jesus got through shutting them down. By saying, I have come to call sinners to repentance. I have come to heal those who know they can't heal themselves. I have come to save those who understand they can't be saved by their own righteousness. And how do they respond to that? Not with conviction. Not with faith and repentance. But they switch the question. They switch it from, why do your disciples eat and drink with publicans and sinners? To, well, why don't your disciples fast? You see that? The first question was to show that they were more righteous than Jesus in their minds and they were more righteous than, than his disciples because they wouldn't dare eat, drink with publicans and sinners. And when Jesus shut them down there, immediately they came back and said, okay, but you guys don't fast like we do. It's almost like children on the playground. Nana, nana, boo, boo. They're doing the same exact thing in both, in, both instances. They're setting their self-righteousness up the standard by which men should be judged. My immediate reaction to this, that I were Jesus, and I'm glad I, I'm not, I, I, I don't know how I wouldn't have just rolled my eyes and sighed and thought, are you kidding me? Because though it shouldn't shock us to know the depths the scribes and Pharisees would go to try and prove themselves more righteous than Jesus and everyone, it somehow doesn't cease to amaze us, does it? But you might be a little more amazed when you go back with me to Matthew chapter 9. In the parallel passage in, in Matthew chapter 9. I want you to look at something with me. In Matthew chapter 9, in verse 9. Jesus passed forth from thence. He saw a man named Matthew sitting at the receipt of custom. And he said to him, follow me. And Matthew arose and followed him. And it came to pass, as Jesus sat at meat in the house. Behold, many publicans and sinners came and sat down with him and his disciples. And when the Pharisees saw it, they said unto his disciples, Why does your master eat with public and sinners? When Jesus heard that, he said unto them, They that behold need not a physician, but they that be sick. Go ye and learn what that means. I will have mercy and not sacrifice, for I am not come to call the righteous, but sinners to repentance. Now, that, that sounds familiar, right? That's, that's the parallel passage to what we just read in Luke chapter 5 in the last time we were there. That sounds exactly what, what Luke is telling us, but I... I want you to go down to verse 14. You might be surprised to learn that the scribes and Pharisees had, had some strange bedfellows, if you will. Then came to him the disciples of John, saying, Why do we and the Pharisees fast all? But thy disciples fast not. Matthew records something for us here that Luke does not record. Matthew tells us that the disciples of John are actually asking the same question about fasting that Luke indicates that the Pharisees were asking. So what goes on? What's going on here? Are, are, Ma are Matthew and Luke at odds with one another? I don't believe so, because I want you to go to the next gospel, the gospel according to Mark, and look at chapter 2 and verse 14. And as he passed by, he saw Levi, the son of Alphaeus, sitting at the receipt of custom, and said unto him, Follow me, and he arose and followed him. Again, the parallel passage to Matthew 9, and to Luke 5. So I want you to skip down to verse 18 and see with us. Skip down to verse 18. And the disciples of John and of the Pharisees used to fast, and they come and say unto him, they, notice the plural there, they, both the disciples of John and the Pharisees came. It wasn't just one group. It was both groups that came asking the same question. 
Why are you not fasting? Why do your disciples not fast? Why do they eat and drink? Now, I, I do find it interesting that the disciples of John were, were seemingly, and I want you to notice that, that word seemingly in agreement with the Pharisees on this point. So what do we, what do, we do with this? Well, first and foremost, I think it's imperative, it's very important that, that I point out the similarities between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples. Bishop J.C. Ryle is, is extremely helpful here, so I'm going to read some from him. He says this, We cannot suppose that there was any essential difference between the doctrines held by the disciples of Christ and the disciples of John. For the teaching of John the Baptist was doubtless clear and explicit upon all the main points necessary to salvation. In other words, we could put it this way in, in a manner which I've been saying all along. Jesus' disciples and John's disciples would have been in full agreement on each core doctrine of the Apostles' Creed had it been written. They wouldn't have differed one iota on those doctrines, and we wouldn't and shouldn't have expected them to. John, as Ryle says, was the man who could say of Jesus, Behold the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sins of the world. Was not, he was not likely, Ryle says, to teach his followers anything contrary to the gospel. Amen. His teaching, of course, lacked the fullness and perfection of his divine master's teaching, but it is absurd to suppose that it contradicted it. And we can all give a hearty amen to what Ryle said there. Remember what Jesus said about John the Baptist. He said, of those born of women, there was none greater. Now, would Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would he have said that about a man who didn't agree with what God says and on the essential doctrines of salvation in the kingdom of God? Absolutely not. Jesus Christ, the Son of God, would never have said that about John the Baptist. So we understand, we need to understand, there is no difference between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples on the issues of salvation, redemption, repentance, faith, holiness, the kingdom of God. Nevertheless, Ryle says, and I think very astutely, there were points of practice on which the disciples differed from those of Christ. I want that to sink in for just a moment. You see, Ryle called it a difference between being one in heart and hope and aim concerning the weightier matters of inward religion, but not entirely of one mind about the outward matter. It's extremely important that we understand that the same could not be said about Jesus' disciples and the Pharisees. They were not one at all. They were not one concerning the weightier matters of inward religion. The same also could, could not be said about John's disciples and the Pharisees. Neither were they one concerning the weightier matters of, of inward religion with the Pharisees. So my point is this. I don't don't need to lose sleep over the fact that both John's disciples and the Pharisees were pressing Jesus over the same outward matter. But let's stop and, and think that through for a moment. Jesus Christ, the eternal Son of God, he, He's always right. Amen? It is, word, it is His word upon which we rely. And in this instance, He's about to correct everyone on the topic of fasting. And we'll get to that in just a few moments. And it's imperative to understand that when, when Jesus corrects, we better listen. And I believe John's disciples did listen, did listen to what Jesus was saying, but the Pharisees did not. Because I'm with, I'm with G.I. Williamson here when he said that the Pharisees and scribes, they were asking this question to press Jesus and to try to trap him. That's what they were always seemingly trying to do, always trying to trap Jesus. But John's disciples were genuinely seeking an answer, Williamson says, from Jesus. Because they just didn't understand it. Have we ever been there? <laughs> There's nothing wrong with that. Going to the Word of God. Seeking from the Word of God something that we don't understand. That's what we are to do. And so Jesus consistently said a phrase during His earthly ministry here. He said, those that have ears to hear, let them hear what the Spirit says. He said that some 15 times during His ministry. And sadly, most of the Pharisees proved they did not have spiritual ears to hear. And so what that is, that's a, that's a telltale sign of someone who not only will be belligerent towards you, 
not agreeing with them on outward matters, but they simply won't align with the biblical doctrines of what Ryle calls, calls, it, calls the weightier inward matters of religion. Again, I think it's important to, to stress that Jesus corrected everyone on the subject of fasting, as we'll see in a moment. But that's not always the case. It, it's not always so cut and dry when it comes to outward matters. This, this text alone is not an easy text. And that's why Ryle says, and I think very wisely, we must, I want you to listen to this, we must make up our minds to see differences of this kind among Christians so long as the world stands. We may regret them much, he said, because of the handle they give to an ignorant and prejudiced world. But they will exist and are one of the many evidences of our fallen condition. About church government, Ryle says, about the manner of conducting public worship, about fasts and feasts, as we see in our text, and saints' days and ceremonials. Ryle says, Christians have never been entirely of one mind, even from the days of the apostles. On all these points, the holiest and ablest servants of God have arrived at different conclusions. And I'm sorry for using such lengthy quotes. I don't, I don't generally do that. But Ryle is so good here. And he's fantastic. He reminds us, but though these outward matters exist that we may not all agree on, we must bless God, Ryle says, that there is a mighty unity among all true believers of every name and nation and people and time. Those things that Ryle talks about that we shall think about in our hour of death and the day of judgment, those core truths, those weightier matters of inward religion that bring unity by the Spirit of Christ. Ryle says it will signify little at the last day what we thought about fasting and eating and drinking and ceremonies. Did we repent and bring forth first fruits, meat for repentance? Did we behold the Lamb of God by faith and receive Him as our Savior? Ryle says all of every church who are found right on these points will be saved. All of every church who are found wrong on these points will be lost forevermore. we got to take a breath here. I think there's one last thing I must say on this subject before showing how Jesus responded to John's disciples and the Pharisees. And I believe it's a necessary warning here for the people of God. Because how easy it is for us to find ourselves influenced by the wrong people and the wrong things. And so we must be tremendously careful to guard our hearts. Now, I'm not convinced that John's disciples were influenced by the Pharisees on this matter. I tried to point out already, I don't think that they were you know, these strange bedfellows at all on this subject because they certainly didn't agree with each other on, on most every other area so far as we can tell. We need to understand something here. The unregenerate world hates the Lord Jesus Christ. The unregenerate world hates the things of Christ. The unregenerate world hates the Word of God. The unregenerate world hates the church. The unregenerate world hates truth. It comes from God's Word and the doctrine found in God's Word. The unregenerate world hates the Christian worldview. And we need to be vigilant in our understanding of that. And we need to be taking defense against it. Those with secularist, humanistic worldviews, they will show no mercy in these things. They want to indoctrinate our children. They want to indoctrinate our grandchildren in these things. And it doesn't matter how good they seem and how religious they seem. You better be aware and be on guard to defend the truth and instill it in the common folk at all times. Children, grandchildren, instill it in their hearts at all times. Look at the Pharisees. To the common folk, they were religious leaders of the day in that they constantly were pushing back against the things of Christ. So though I don't believe this is what occurred here, let us as the people of God ever beware of drifting toward that kind of mindset in the name of what the world would call unity and tolerance. Our unity in the church is built upon the truth of God's Word by the Spirit of the Lord. And we may not see eye to eye on every outward matter, but we sure need biblical discernment with the things that we should be agreeing with. Amen. And we need biblical discernment to not be agreeing with the unregenerate on these things. I'm of the mindset if we find ourselves agreeing with the world on too many things in, in general at all, we should stop and examine our hearts and ask, why is that so? Because the world hates the truth. 
They love darkness and not the light. And our calling is to let our light shine before men that they may see our good works and glorify our Father in heaven. That should be the end of all that we do. And if that means we make some waves in the world and people don't like us and people get mad at us because we're standing for the truth, then so be it. Our King is King Jesus. What He says is our authority. What He says we stand upon, even if that makes the religious leaders and people of this world angry. And as far as that, how that affects us internally, I have to think about that as, as your minister. That is within the church at Post Oak. I understand that not everybody in here is going to see eye to eye with every one of my outward matters or even some of the weightier non-salvific doctrines like eschatology or sacramentology. Al Mohler, I think, he, he, he did a really good job dealing with this. He wrote an article that Ligonier Ministries published in Table Talk. And in it he said there really are three levels of issues within a church that we can, should be concerned about. The first order doctrines. Those are the things, for example, that fall within the Apostles' Creed. Those things we cannot disagree on. And without these truths, the church falls. This is one reason we remind ourselves of these truths each Lord's Day through the Apostles' Creed. But then he talks about second order of issues. And that would be the doctrines I've been mentioning, such as eschatology and sacramentology. Asking, do you believe the Lord Jesus will return before a millennial reign? Here's something that we cannot disagree on. We cannot disagree on the fact that the Lord Jesus Christ will return because that's what the Word of God says. But the question, do you believe the Lord Jesus will return before a millennial reign? Or do you believe a child should be baptized into the covenant as an infant? Or should you wait for a credible profession of faith? These are the issues that history has proven where good Christians trying to hammer out agreements realized they weren't going to see eye to eye on everything. So what do we have today? A church on every corner, right? Denominations. Baptists, for example, believe in credo-baptism. What does that mean? Well, that means baptizing only after a credible profession of faith. Presbyterians and most Reformed denominations believe in paedo-baptism. That is this. Our children are baptized as a sign and seal of the covenant. That is what we believe here at Post Oak Presbyterian Church because we are Presbyterian by name and we reform covenant theology and doctrine. But we love our Baptist brethren. And we're thankful for them. Connie whispered on my, in my ear on the way out, thanks for letting your, our, your, these, our, these Baptists attend last night. I said, are you kidding me? I know she was just kidding me. We love our Baptist brethren. We love them. And it doesn't have to shake our unity or our growing and spiritual maturity of a congregation. And that's, that's the importance of a strong church constitution especially for a congregation like ours, which is elder-led, but because we have disaffiliated with the mainline denomination, which we have, we don't have accountability to a presbytery or a general assembly. And that's the importance of having a document that lays out the belief system of the church as a whole. We strive to keep growing in the Lord as one body through the knowledge of truth found in God's Word. And again, it's why these secondary the, the, the second doctrines, as Moeller calls them. It's why we have so many denominations today. But the third and final thing Moeller mentions are the issues that Paul refers to in Romans 14, where one man believes he can eat all things to the glory of God, and another does not believe that. One man puts a certain emphasis on specific days where others do not. Paul says God has received both men, therefore there should be no, no disunity in the church about these outward matters. And this is the importance of, of strong biblical elders that can discern between these things and govern through them. Because there are many issues in the Bible, beloved, that, that the Bible is not silent on that the church should either be standing for or against. I mentioned earlier abortion. We don't have to, we don't have to ask whether the church should be standing against abortion. Homosexuality. We don't have to ask whether the church should be standing against that. Feminism. Worldly ideas about social justice and woke ideology. I don't believe the Bible is silent on these things. Therefore, we can't just throw these things into this third category and say they don't really matter when they do indeed matter. And they can tear a church apart from limb to limb. And if we find ourselves aligning with the unregenerate world on these matters, there's a real problem. 
These are not matters of preference, and they never should be to Christians or the Christian church. They should always be matters of conviction. We might disagree on fasting, but we should never disagree on the things I just mentioned, just to name a few. Again, this is the importance of a strong church leadership because these things can turn sideways in a hurry and destroy a local assembly. And I'm thankful for Post Oak Presbyterian Church. And so I want to close with this, to fast or not to fast. That is the question. Why did Jesus close this section the way he did? Couldn't he have just let it go and, and said, well, you know, boys, fasting is just a matter of preference. <laughs> if you fast, great. If not, great. But that's not what he did. The Old Covenant, the Old Testament, reveals several instances of individual and corporate public fasting. But in reality, the Mosaic Law only commanded a fast one time, Yom Kippur, on the Day of Atonement. You find that in Leviticus 16, 29-31. We won't turn there for sake of time. But I want to make something so clear. It is clear that the Pharisees and John's disciples were participating in additional fasting to the Mosaic Law. Or traditional fasting. Ken Jones wrote about it and said this was a tradition within Jewish piety. And that's fine. It's fine. Jesus wasn't rebuking the tradition of piety. So what is the problem here? Why didn't Jesus just say, okay, sirrah, sirrah, whatever will be, will be about fasting to the Pharisees and John's disciples? What is Jesus, what is Jesus trying to teach us here as, as we close this morning? I think what Jesus was trying to, to get to John's disciples at, at the very least to ask is this question. Why are you fasting? Isn't that what he says in the rest of our text back in Luke? He says, can you make the children of the bride chamber fast while the bridegroom is with them? What Jesus is saying to John's disciples, I'm here with you right now. Fasting in Scripture if you study it out, it's an expression of longing and desire for the Lord's presence and power. It's a wonderful thing. But fasting in Scripture is also a sign of humbling, and repentance, and sorrow, and mourning. When it was required under, under the Mosaic Law on the Day of Atonement, it was a showing and a longing and a desire for full atonement. For the Messiah, the Sabbath rest had yet to come. But now here he was. He had come. He was right before them. And it just went to show that so often the things that, that the Pharisees and the disciples of John were doing, they didn't even realize why they were doing them. Jesus said, I'm the bridegroom. I'm here. There should be rejoicing. There should not be mourning and fasting. He says in the very next verse, the time will come when the bridegroom is taken away. And then there will be a time of mourning and fasting. But right now, right now, why would you fast for the presence of the one who is right here in your presence. That's what he's asking them. You say you're longing for the newness, the full atonement that the Messiah will bring. And why are you clinging to that which is old while the Messiah is in your presence? Man of sorrows, what a name for the Son of God who came, ruined sinners to reclaim. Hallelujah, what a Savior. Guilty, vile, and helpless we. Listen, spotless Lamb of God was he. Full atonement can it be. Hallelujah. What a Savior. And yet Jesus said there will come a time when his disciples will fast again, when the bridegroom is taken away. After his death, and even then his resurrection and ascension, we find fasting practice in the book of Acts. And so I close with this practical application to remind you we're not bound to the ceremonial laws of Moses. Therefore, I personally don't believe fasting is something that must be done today. I believe it's a good practice. I believe we're living in an already not yet eschatological time where I do believe that fasting can be done as a practice of humbling ourselves and longing for the second return of King Jesus. John Calvin, we stand upon his shoulders. He said, fasting is a holy exercise both for the humbling of men and for their confession of humility. And so at the end of the day, I certainly don't believe it's something that should bring disunity within the church as it would likely fall in line with the things Paul talked about in Romans 14. Some believers fast, some believers don't. The danger is when we get that pharisaical attitude. 
say, oh, I fast on Monday and Thursday. Two days out of the week I fast. How about you? Right? Something that should not divide us, but rather something we should be humble and we should learn from one another in. But I close with this practical application for our hearts. We must ask ourselves as God's people, why are we doing what we do? That goes for all things. Do we understand the biblical teaching on these things? Are we humble enough to submit ourselves under the authority of God's word when we are mistaken as John's disciples were about the subject? And they were mistaken about it. And they were corrected by Jesus. So we have to ask ourselves, do we do things just because these things are tradition? Just because our families did them and passed them down to us? That's a wonderful thing. That's a glorious thing. But why do we do the things we do? Do we do them to the glory of God? Because the Bible teaches whether we eat or drink, whether we fast or mourn, or whatever it is we do, we should do it to the glory of God, not for the appearance of piety and for the praise of man. So these are the questions we must ask about our practices in our daily decisions in life. Whatever you do, do it all to the glory of God. Because man looks on the outward appearance, but God, looks on the heart. Amen. Father, I thank you for your word. I thank you for the truth of it. A lot of, a lot of things were said this morning. A lot of difficult things. A lot of things we must think through. A lot of things we must give thought to. As leaders of the church, must give thought to these things and understand these things. And as I said, be able to govern in and through these things. The congregants, we must give thought to these things in our daily practices, in our daily decisions. Are we doing all things to the glory of God? Are we doing things to be seen of men? God, help us not to do that. Help us to do everything we do to the glory of God and do it diligently unto the Lord and not unto men. In Christ's name, amen. We'll close in response to the preaching of God's word from hymn 344 in our regular hymn book, My Faith Looks Up to You. charges for our hearts this morning take advantage of of our youtube page no there was a lot said so go to it this week and maybe listen to what was said again 
and think through these things if you if you so have the time. But also, a charge I leave you with this morning, beloved. We must ever be praying that we would do all things to the glory of God. Amen. God has blessed our church so much, and I'm so grateful for what God is doing in our midst. And I rejoice in what God is doing, and I just want to encourage all of our hearts to continue to go forth do all things to His glory. So lift up your hearts and receive the benediction of our great God. Now the God of peace that brought again from the dead our Lord Jesus, that great shepherd of the sheep, through the blood of the everlasting covenant, make you perfect in every good work to do His will, working in you that which is well-pleasing in His sight, through Jesus Christ, to whom be glory forever and ever. And amen. Amen. amen.